Hi, welcome back to Antioch Center for the Nations here at Journey with Moses. I'm very excited to be with you. When we were last together in, in the previous session 19, now we're uh, moving into session 20, we talked about Jethro. Moses is now out in the middle of the wilderness, and Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, Sipporah, and the two sons of Moses, Gershom and Eliezer, they are coming over to see Moses after the great victory, after the war, after all these things. See, because when Moses went to do the job, he sent his wife and children to be with his father-in-law. And Jethro is a kind, loving man connected to Moses. For 40 years they've known each other. And we were talking about the nature of godly advice. When some, How do you know someone has the right or the authority to speak into your life. Let it be someone like Jethro to Moses. Let it be someone who's paid a price for you, who's cared for you, who loves for you, has something to lose if you lose. And that's exactly who Jethro is. And so we're going to continue with this as we left off in, uh, this was in number 170. Now Jethro, the priest of Midian, and father-in-law Moses heard of everything God had done for Moses and for his people Israel and how the Lord had brought Israel out of Egypt after Moses had sent away his wife Sipporah, his father-in-law Jethro received her and her two sons. One son was named Gershom, for Moses said, I have become a foreigner in a foreign land. And the other was named Eliezer, for he said, My father's God was my helper. He saved me from the sword of Pharaoh. And Jethro Moses' father-in-law, together with Moses' sons and wife, came to him in the wilderness where he was camped near the mountain of God. Jethro had sent word to him, I, your father-in-law, Jethro, am coming to you with your wife and her two sons. So here we take up where we left off. Jethro goes to visit Moses and they interact. And remember, Jethro is an image of godly advice counsel coming from the right source. Now, Moses gives Jethro a full report concerning the events of the Exodus. It says, so Moses went out to meet his father-in-law. I want you to think about this. Moses is not going out to meet anybody but God. Everybody's coming to Moses. Everyone's following Moses, and Moses is doing his mission, but Jethro he respects. And this is very important. You have to have respect for for the person from or through whom advice is coming. You have to have seen their family, their business, their life, and think this is a successful person. Because if not, if you see them as a failure, you're not going to follow their advice or listen to them. And Moses goes out to meet him, and it says he honors him so much he bowed down and kissed him. This is the kind of people that we are open to when it comes to counsel and help. People we honor and respect so much that we would bow down and kiss them. People who bring tears to your eyes when you're in their company. People you love. And they greeted each other and then went into the tent. Moses told his father-in-law about everything the Lord had done to Pharaoh and the Egyptians for Israel's sake and about all the hardships they had met along the way and how the Lord had saved them. So here Moses gives Jethro a full report about everything that's going on in the process of the exodus, the deliverance. In other words, he sat down with Jethro from the moment he left Jethro's presence, which would probably be about the time right after he had the experience with the burning bush. He told Jethro that, but then he left. So that means there's virtually no correspondence between Jethro and Moses all this time, no, no communication between them as friends and family. And he goes away, but now Jethro is waiting with Moses' do um, wife and children, and he's not hearing anything until the victory comes, the deliverance comes. But of course, that's like reading headlines in a newspaper. But now when he finally meets with Moses, Moses feels the need to detail every single thing. This is called accountability. And you say, well, he's accountable to God. He doesn't need to be accountable to a man. Well, that's not true. See, the, the thing is, accountability has gotten kind of a dirty reputation around it or a fearful mentality. 
when we think about accountability because we believe accountability to be permission for someone to punish us. And that is not the nature of true accountability. Accountability is so that people can help you balance your books, so to speak so that people can speak into your life. Whether you follow the counsel or not, at least that there be a multitude of counsel, there is safety in that, that you hear various opinions. But of course, those opinions matter much concerning the source. In other words, through Jethro, information that Moses would receive would be respected because of his relationship, because of his honor of him, because of his love of him, also because he was an older man with more experience. But so where they're here together, he bows down, he, he greets him, and he tells him everything. There has to be somebody out there that you talk to. There has to be somebody out there that, that you tell everything to. Even if, even if they do not give you solutions. There's something that happens very often in counseling, in fact, as a pastor for people. They will tell me, you know, Stephen, I'd love to just get together and talk. I want to just tell you about what's going on. And they will come and they will tell me all the details about what's going on in their life. And frequently, I do not have to give any counsel at all. I just listen and out of their mouths, I hear truth. I hear their struggles. I hear their feelings. And I do also notice frequently that they already know because they have a relationship with God's Spirit, they already know what they have to do in life. They already have a feeling of what's wrong and right. But when they air it out, when they speak it out, when they give an account to someone to whom they are accountable, the details of their life unfold and you start to see things. When we do this, we start to see things about ourselves we never noticed. How many times have you been carrying a weight of burden, issues, problems in your life, and you finally meet with somebody that you can talk to and you start talking and at first you're casual, but after a while you notice that you just start crying because the burden or the weight of it was built up inside of you, even though you didn't know it, 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 you were paying a price. In other words, you were suffering under the weight, maybe sleeplessness, maybe concern, maybe a form of depression, but it's not until you begin to speak it out, there's a release, a type of catharsis, a, a purging that takes place when you share it. And often that's all you need to do. Sometimes it's just the power of confession good or bad, just telling people what you're going through. But of course, you don't want to do this with the wrong person because they can use your confessions against you. They can use your accounts to hurt you. But if they love you and they respect you like Jethro to Moses, whatever you tell him, he's going to fight on your behalf. He's going to protect you. He's going to guard you. I always tell the students at the core when we do the program every year, they, they learn many principles. I've told them many times, look, whatever... You, whenever you go from this class in the future, you're going to find yourself in different situations. In those moments of your life when you're confused and you don't know who to talk to and you're afraid, maybe you're afraid of being punished, come talk to me. My job is not to judge or punish. My job is to help you learn how to escape the snare of the fowler, how to get out of the traps, even if you built your own traps. Even if you dung, dug your own hole and threw yourself into it, I'll be the guy to fashion a ladder for you to climb out of the hole. I'm going to work on your behalf because I love you and I'm concerned about you. And that's the kind of relationship you need with someone from whom you receive advice and counsel. And that's exactly what Moses is doing here. Now, of course, Moses is in God's hands. He's very close to God. And you would think, well, if you're so close to God, you would never need to talk to anybody. But that's not true. No matter how close, no matter how anointed you are, no matter how gifted you are, no matter how called you feel, there is something that you cannot do in your confession to God that can only be accomplished in your confession or accountability to man. When you speak to them, then truth unfolds. And that's just the beginning of advice. Your confession comes first. And that's what Moses is doing in this passage. He's telling him, everything about all the things the Lord had done, the deliverance, the power, the good, the bad, and the ugly, he's telling him everything. And you know he's complaining about the Israelites and that they're murmuring. And can you believe these guys are blaming me for not having water and they this and they that. And sometimes you just need to vent 
And I believe that this is exactly what's taking place here with Moses. And you find the right person to vent to, otherwise the vent will vomit it all back in your face and hurt you. <laughs> I can be a vent. I don't mind listening to people's problems. I don't mind. I might not have a solution, but sometimes it's not always about finding a solution. It's about unburdening yourself so someone else can help carry the weight of the unresolved issues. So here's Moses, a very, very long way away from the fulfillment of his ministry. He has done great things. If his ministry was simply to deliver the Israelites from Egypt, done, check, been there, done that, has the t-shirt. He should just, just go settle back with his sheep. But that's we don't get people delivered to leave them in the wilderness. We nurture, we protect, we teach, we lead, we God. Discipleship is so much more important than soul winning. And soul winning, you know, people sometimes feel really good about going out into the streets and handing out a bunch of gospel tracts and convincing people to say the sinner's prayer. And that's a good thing. But ultimately, are you willing to disciple them? Are you willing to take them into your life? Are you willing to develop a relationship of accountability and connection that can lead them and guide them? That's what really matters most. So now we're going to continue in this story. Let's get back to Moses and Jethro. Jethro accepts Jehovah as the greatest of all gods and offers sacrifice. You can say here that Jethro is getting saved. This is Moses telling, testifying about the immensity of God's delivering power. And Jethro is a priest of other of a religious priest of Midian. He has probably connected to many different types of deities and ideas and spiritual principles. And now he has been exposed to all different gods. But after hearing these exploits, changes his mind about all gods. It says Jethro was delighted to hear about all the good things the Lord had done for Israel in rescuing them from the hand of the Egyptians. He said, Praise be to the Lord who rescued you from the hand of the Egyptians and of Pharaoh and who rescued the people from the hand of the Egyptians. Now I know that the Lord is greater than all other gods. For he did this to those who had treated Israel arrogantly. Then Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, brought a burnt offering and other sacrifices to God. And Aaron came with all the elders of Israel to eat a meal with Moses' father-in-law in the presence of God. So here, this is Jethro accepting. So that means during the time that Moses was with Jethro, in the wilderness, Jehovah God was not necessarily the topic of conversation, nor was it something that Jethro decided to follow. But here, this changes everything. Relationships with mentors, with people that you connect to for advice. So you're not always going to talk to people who are identically like you. You're not always going to talk to people who believe exactly how you believe. But when they help you, you together will grow. They will grow in their knowledge of Christ. You will grow in your knowledge of how to live your life through these, this multitude of counsel that's surrounding you. And so here they are together rejoicing in a wonderful moment as Jethro accepts Jehovah God. Now we see Jethro examines the method of leadership of Moses over the Israelites. So now basically in the last point there, Jethro and Moses have come into an agreement. And notice they both agree that Yahweh God is the only true God and that everything else is inferior and it's just wood, hay, and stubble. It's fake idols, but God is God. They rejoice in that and now that's another level of this relationship, agreement. When the person that you're listening to gives you advice, you need to see that they have an agreement with you about your moving forward. If they're not in agreement with what God is telling you, what God is doing, then they, their advice will work against the principles of God. In fact, they will work for the enemy to dissuade you or thwart your progress in Christ. But if they honor God the way you honor God, and that's exactly what happens with Jethro here, then the connection is better. But here now, Jethro is examining the method of leadership. He's watching Moses very carefully in verse 13 of Exodus 18. The next day, Moses took his seat to serve as judge for the people. And they stood around him from morning till evening. So this is at least 
12 hours of listening to bickering and complaining and fights and arguments. When his father-in-law saw all that Moses was doing for the people, he said, what is this you're doing for the people? And why do you alone sit as judge while all these people stand around you from morning till evening? And Moses answered him. Now, I want to say something here before we get into Moses' answer. This is questioning. Nobody likes to be audited. Nobody likes to be questioned. Nobody wants to be examined. I don't even like standing on the bathroom scale. I, I don't want anybody to break me down and judge me. But there are times we need to be with people who call into question our methods and who we are. But for this to work, it has to be a Jethro to Moses. It has to be somebody who does care, someone you do trust. Not everybody has the right to just speak into your life. Not everyone has the right to just come along and criticize and tell or call you into. If somebody comes and has questions about why you're doing this and who do you think you are, I don't have to answer them. In fact, I disregard them. It's like, I don't, I don't know you and I owe you nothing. You're not the boss of me. <laughs> and I can walk away from them and just ignore them or change the subject. But if it's somebody with whom I have a relationship like Jethro with Moses, when they ask questions, what is this that you're doing for the people? Or why do you alone sit as judge while all, while all these people stand around you from morning to I've been watching. This means that, that Moses was with Jethro for 12 hours that day. Jethro watched him all day long doing his job. In other words, Jethro did not immediately jump to conclusions, but carefully examined. He took the time to learn everything that was going on in Moses' life at this current time before he starts asking questions. And then, this is, I know this is true because he asked the question, why do you stand, or they stand around you from morning till evening? That means he witnessed morning till evening. So for at least 12 hours, without raising his voice, without saying anything, without asking a question, this is probably afterward when they're sitting together having dinner, he's questioning now. And Moses answered him, well, I do this because people come to me to see God's will. So Moses believes he's doing the right thing, and he's trying to be a judge for them and a help. He tried to be a judge 40 years before this, remember? Are you a judge with us? The, even the, the Jewish people said it then, but now they're coming to him for help. And so Moses is just supposing that he's doing exactly what God called him to do. But a call and the methodology we use to execute that call are two different things. The fact that you're called to do something or be something or have a ministry is one thing, but the way that you achieve it, the way that you accomplish it, is something that God leaves up to you. You make sure. He works with us, confirming with signs and wonders. He doesn't give us exact strategies. He just tells us generalities. He gives us a direction. He gives us a basic task. He says, build a table. He doesn't tell you all the time exactly how to do that. Sometimes you choose the wood and you get the tools and you use power tools or hand tools or whatever and you choose the color of the varnish. Your table is a table. Sometimes it's very general. If he calls you, go, to the, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Well, gosh, that can be so many things. There's a lot of world out there. And so God will lead you step by step. And Moses just knows that he's supposed to arbitrate for these people and he's doing it. Whenever they have a dispute, he says in verse 16, it is brought to me and I decide between the parties and inform them of God's decrees and instructions. So he is a liaison between God and man. This is a normal arbitrator position as a priest type. He's looking to help them and Jethro is watching this, but Jethro doesn't like it and he's not comfortable with it. So he's calling it into question and he's about to help Moses. He's about to save Moses' life from Moses destroying himself because of too much stress and anguish in the way that he does his job. So because he loves Moses and he has this history with him, he is going to carefully bring him to a place of productivity and learning. And this is exactly what people who love you want to do. So in number 174, we continue where it says Jethro criticizes 
the way Moses administrates the Israelites. Now, this is where it's tough because nobody likes to be criticized. But in verse 17, Moses' father-in-law replied after Moses said, well, they come to me because they have these issues and I give them the voice of God and I tell them what God thinks. So he says to him directly, Moses' father-in-law, what you are doing is not good. Wow, from the beginning, for somebody to tell you that's not good, uh, you need to be open to that person. You need to know that person. And you need to not take it as a slap in the face, but as love. That's proper correction, proper advice and counsel. You and these people who come to you will only wear yourselves out. The work is too heavy for you. You cannot handle it alone. So now he's telling him truth. The truth is, yes, it's too much. Moses can't handle it. Eventually, he will burn himself out. If he does not change the methodology with which he is administrating these people, he will weary himself to death and die. He will learn to hate the people. This is what people often do in ministry too. Pastors and leaders, sometimes they get so involved in the ministry work and they get so stressed, they spread themselves out too thin and they actually, they need to learn how to delegate. And this is what Jethro is telling him. He says, listen now to me. He's saying, listen to what I have to say. And I'm sure Moses is all ears. I will give you some advice. And may God be with you. You must be the people's representative before God and bring their disputes to him. Nobody's arguing that, Moses. Teach them his decrees and instructions and show them the way they are to live and how they are to behave. But... Select capable men from all the people, men who fear God, trustworthy men who hate dishonest gain, and appoint them as officials over thousands, hundreds, fifties, and tens. Have them serve as judges for the people at all times, but have them bring every difficult case to you. Now, Moses, you will become like the Supreme Court. The small cases, they cannot be settled if they ask to make an appeal and then they will come to you. And that will make your load lighter, he says. If they, they'll bring the difficult case to you, the simple cases, they can decide for themselves. They'll sort all that out. There will be a filter for you. And that will make your, light, or your load lighter because they will share it with you. This is some of the wisest advice that Jethro is giving Moses, telling him to share, to distribute this weight and these responsibilities with people in the camp. And this is often what pastors have trouble doing. And I'm going to tell you, I'm going to be totally honest with you as a pastor for years and for, as a ministry leader, one of the reasons why we are not always good at doing this delegation is because we live by a principle that is a little short-sighted called, if you want something done right, do it yourself. And unfortunately, it's true for many things. But we, as, it'd be like Jesus saying, if you want something done right, do it yourself. So therefore, I'm not going to send the disciples out. I sent them out to cast out devils. And they went out there, but they couldn't even do it. And by the time I went up on the Mount of Transfiguration and come back down, here they are with a boy, then they cannot minister deliverance for him. So they failed to so forget it. If you want something done right, do it yourself. No more deliverance ministry for the disciples. I, Jesus, am going to do it all on my own. Of course, he didn't do that. He taught them with that example. He showed them. And one of the things that causes us as leaders to not want to give these responsibilities to people, delegate responsibilities, because often they're not going to do it the way we would do it. But it doesn't mean it's not getting done. We go back to the analogy of building a table. If I took five people and said, look, we need five tables and build these tables. We just, I just want them to be, even if I gave them dimensions, even if I gave them instructions and a plan and a basic idea, still you're going to have five different kinds of tables because every individual is different. Every individual is going to express him or herself in different ways and therefore what they produce will be different as well as their product of work in ministry, in churches, in life. They're going to do things the way they will do them. But ultimately, what's the goal? Look at the far picture. Like God deals with you, when God tells you to do something, so also you will deal with the people. You will commission them and tell them, and then they will do it. And this is what Jethro knows is the successful form of doing it. But Moses is so concerned and so particular 
about it being done exactly a certain way that he is not at first willing to do these things. And it doesn't occur to him that he should until wise advice comes from his father-in-law who says, now listen to me and I'll give you some advice. And may, may God be with you. It will make your load easier if you do it this way. And so he's telling this to Moses, and Moses responds to him after hearing this advice. He accepts the counsel of Jethro. If you do this, Jethro says, and God so commands. Now, this is an extremely important clause when it comes to counsel. From the perspective of the counselor, the Jethro type, when you are counseling someone, no matter how much you believe you know God's purposes for this person that you're speaking to, Never say, God said. Say, this is what I think. And if you do this, and God so commands. In other words, if you feel God, if it's okay with God, and it's okay with you. In other words, that, not, the bad counsel will always have these phrases connect to it. The Lord told me to tell you. But see, as soon as somebody comes to me and says, God told me to tell you this, that, I immediately... I'm not really interested. That kind of closes me right away. You say, well, you have an unteachable spirit. No, not at all. I just know from experience that that really produces any form of success or life. Usually just some busy-bodied individual that thinks they know everything. But when someone comes and says, you know, I just have some ideas. Listen to me. You just don't, you don't need to do this. I just think. And if it's okay with you, if you agree and you think God is leading you to do that, then I think this is good. And that's just exactly what Jethro does with Moses. If you do this and God so commands, you will be able to stand the strain and all these people will go home satisfied. It'll be a good, a win-win scenario for everyone. And Moses listened to his father-in-law and did everything he said. So he followed his exact advice. He chose capable men from all Israel and made them leaders of the people, officials over thousands, hundreds, fifties, and tens. And they served as judges for the people at all times. The difficult cases they brought to Moses, but the simple ones they decided themselves. Then Moses sent his father-in-law on his way, and Jethro returned to his own country. And this is the final perspective I see here about these kind of relationships. When the counsel is finished, counsel, advice coming from someone, does not mean they take a permanent seat of authority in your life. Does not mean they stand above you and everything must be passed by them. It means they're available to you when you need them. And at key moments when you are making mistakes, they can come into your life with love and give you advice that will help you and solve problems, and then they will go away and leave you alone. And that's what's so important. This is the way that I have lived ministry through the years. I don't want a lot of interference. I want to do what God's called me to do. I want to live exactly as I read in the scriptures. I want to do what the Word of God says. I want to I live my life serving people and serving the church and functioning the way God's called me to function. If there are issues and problems, I reach out to my friends and I ask for counsel. I ask for help. When I know that I'm overwhelmed, when I know I can't solve certain issues, I reach out and say, look, can you help me with this or with that? And friends that are close to me, the Jethro's in my life will speak to me. I've had a lot more Jethro's in the past. I have less now. You say, why is that? Well, because they're dying. They're older. Jethro's, and Jethro inevitably dies, but I still have many in my life that speak, and I can reach out to them, and I thank God for that kind of accountability and connection. There are, of course, lots of different doctrines and ideas about that kind of accountability, about that kind of a connection. There's some, some very hard teachings about submission to authority being that you are almost like militaristic in the sense that you are a soldier and whatever the men above you tell you, there's colonels and there's generals in the army of God and, and I don't see that in the church world. I see the Spirit of God in control. I see men working together in agreement. When they do not agree, I see them just going their separate ways and doing the things they must do. I've seen more disagreements end up with division, and a lot of people say, see that again as a dirty word, division. It's not 
it means also multiplication. Multiplication and, and is, uh, division is just to cut in half. Multiplication is to grow and expand. And this is exactly what you find when there are disagreements. Often when people are about the purposes of God and they're trying to do great things for the Lord and they're trying to be successful in their ministry, there will be, they will be at odds with one another. And eventually they'll get to a point where they cannot agree. What do you do then? Hate each other and storm off? No, it's okay to discuss. It's okay to argue, but you may have to diverge into separate. I call that cellular division and development. Then you do your thing and he does his thing. She does her thing. Every individual goes their way, but you do not have to harbor bitterness toward people. And this is what's good about the fact that Jethro leaves. Moses receives the advice. He continues in his place, in his position, and his authority. And Jethro then goes home and leaves him alone. And the ministry continues. And the rest of the story, of course, goes on. And we're going to have to do that in other sessions because we're out of time. But I want to pray for you. Father, we know that you have given us tasks. You've given us purposes. And you have pointed us in certain directions to do exact things and we're working at those things we work for you and we do our best at times we get confused at times we get uh, weary at times like Moses uh, we cannot hold our hands up and I thank God that we have people around us like Aaron and her to pick up our hands so that the battle can continue successfully there are times when we are operating and getting ourselves in over our heads and we need Jethro to come and to give us advice, to explain things to us. But the nature in which Jethro did this, Lord, I pray that we all find advisors like that. Advisors that love us, that respect us, and that we also respect and that we have relationships with. I pray for every lonely individual out there that has no counsel, no connection. Lord, I pray that they would know that I'm here to help, to teach, to explain, to, to have discussions about their future and where they're going. I'm happy to give advice without any control whatsoever. And when I'm done, I will go back to Midian and leave Moses alone. So, Lord, give us all that kind of relationship. Thank you for this example in the life of Moses. Thank you for this session. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. I look forward to seeing you again very soon.